Hello and welcome to the program, Sula's Big Adventures, with me, Sula. This is chapter 14 of my multi-part series, Sula's Complete Video Guide to Becoming an Amateur Astronomer. Chapter 14, Observing the Sun. Before we get started with Observing the Sun, I would like to make a correction about chapter 13, which was about the Milky Way, because in chapter 13, I said that the Milky Way was about 14 billion years old, and one of the viewers disagreed with me. And indeed, the Milky Way is only 13.6 billion years old. So I wanted to correct that. And now we can get started with observing the sun. Our sun is a 4.5 billion year old star, a hot glowing ball of hydrogen and helium. And it's at the center of our solar system. The sun is about 93 million miles or 150 million kilometers from Earth. And without its energy, life as we know it could not exist here on our tiny little planet. The sun is the largest object in the solar system, and the sun's volume would need 1.3 million Earths to fill it. Its gravity holds the solar system together, keeping everything from the biggest planets to the smallest little bits of debris in orbit around it. The hottest part of the sun is its core, where the temperatures top 27 million degrees Fahrenheit, or 15 million degrees Celsius. The sun's activity, from its powerful eruptions to the steady stream of charged particles it sends out, influence the nature of space throughout the solar system. From our vantage point here on Earth, the sun may appear like an unchanging source of light and heat in the sky, but the sun is a dynamic star and it's constantly changing and sending energy out into space. The sun's diameter is about 865,000 miles or 1.4 million kilometers. Even though the sun is the center of our solar system and essential to our survival, it's only an average star in terms of its size. Stars up to a hundred times bigger have been found in the universe. And many solar systems have more than one star. In fact, most stars that you see in the sky are double stars. So it's unusual that our solar system just has one. The part of the sun that we call its surface is the photosphere. And it's a relatively cool 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit or 5,500 degrees Celsius. However, the sun's outer atmosphere, the corona, gets hotter the farther it stretches from the surface. The corona reaches up to 3.5 million degrees Fahrenheit or 2 million degrees Celsius, much, much hotter than the photosphere. The sun has been called by many names. The Latin word for sun is sol, uh, also in Spanish. And that's the main adjective for all things sun related. Helios, the sun god in ancient Greek mythology, lends his name to many sun-related terms as well, such as heliosphere. The sun formed about 4.6 billion years ago in a giant spinning cloud of gas and dust called the solar nebula. As the nebula collapsed under its own gravity, it spun faster and it flattened into a disk. Sound familiar? Most of the nebula's material was pulled toward the center to form our sun, which accounts for 99.8% of our solar system's mass. Much of the remaining material formed the planets and other objects that now orbit the sun. The leftover gas and dust was blown away by the young sun's early solar wind. Like all stars, our sun will eventually run out of energy, and when it starts to die, the sun will expand into a, a red giant like Betelgeuse and it will become so large that it will engulf Mercury and Venus and possibly the Earth as well. Scientists predict that the sun is a little less than halfway through its life and it will last another approximately 5 billion years or so before it becomes a white dwarf. The sun doesn't have a solid surface like Earth and the other rocky planets and moons. The part of the sun commonly called its surface is actually the photosphere. 
The word photosphere means light sphere, and this is the layer that emits the most visible light. It's what we see from Earth with our eyes, well, so to speak, protected eyes, never look directly at the sun without protection because you can go blind. Although we call it the surface, the photosphere is actually the first layer of the solar atmosphere. It's about 200 times thick, and it's much cooler than the blazing core, but it's still hot enough to uh, make carbon, like diamonds and graphite, not just melt, but boil. Most of the sun's radiation escapes outward from the photosphere into space. Above this photosphere is the chromosphere, and that's the transition zone between the uh, photosphere and the corona. But some scientists refer to the transition zone simply as the thin layer where the chromosphere rapidly heats and becomes the corona. The photosphere, chromosphere, and corona are all part of the sun's atmosphere. And the corona is sometimes referred to as the sun's atmosphere, but it's actually the sun's upper atmosphere. The sun's atmosphere is where we see features such as sunspots, corona holes, solar flares, and visible light from these top regions of the sun are actually too weak to be seen against the brighter photosphere. But during a total solar eclipse, when the moon covers the photosphere, the chromosphere looks like a fine red rim around the sun. While the corona forms a beautiful white crown, corona means crown in Latin and Spanish, with plasma streamers narrowing outward, forming shapes that look like flower petals. In one of the sun's biggest mysteries, the corona is much hotter than the layers immediately below it. The source of coronal heating is a major unsolved puzzle in the study of the sun. The sun generates magnetic fields that extend out into space to form the interplanetary magnetic field, the magnetic field that pervades our solar system. The field is carried through the solar system by the solar wind, a stream of electrically charged gas blowing outward from the sun in all directions. The vast bubble of space dominated by the sun's magnetic field is called the heliosphere. Since the sun rotates, the magnetic field spins out into a large rotating spiral known as the Parker spiral. This spiral has a shape something like the pattern of a rotating garden sprinkler. The sun doesn't behave the same way all the time. It goes through phases of low, activity, low magnetic activity that make up a cycle. Approximately every 11 years, the sun's geographic poles change. The magnetic polarity, the north and south, and the magnetic poles swap, in other words. During this cycle, the sun's photosphere and chromosphere and the corona change from quiet to violently active. The height of the sun's activity cycle, known as solar maximum, is a time of greatly increased solar storm activity. Sunspots, eruptions, and solar flares and coronal mass ejections are common at solar maximum. The latest solar cycle, the Solar Cycle 25, started in December 2019 when a solar minimum occurred. According to the Solar Cycle 25 Prediction Panel, an international group of experts sponsored by NASA and NOAA, scientists now expect the sun's activity to ramp up in um, the next predicted maximum will be in July 2025. Solar activity can release huge amounts of energy and particles, some of which impact us here on Earth. Much like weather on Earth, condition in space, known as space weather, are always changing with the sun's activity. Space weather can interfere with satellites, GPS, and radio communications. It can also cripple power grids and corrode the pipelines that carry oil and gas. The strongest geomagnetic storm on record is the Carrington event, named for British astronomer Richard Carrington, who observed it in 17, 8, 1859, excuse me. The solar flare that triggered that event sent telegraph systems worldwide haywire. 
it sparked discharges that shocked telegraph operators and it set their telegraph paper on fire. And just before dawn the next day, the skies were all over Earth erupted in red, green, and purple auroras, the result of energy and particles from the sun interacting with the Earth's atmosphere. Reportedly, the auroras were so brilliant that you could read a newspaper in the nighttime as easily in the, as in the daylight. The auroras, or what are called the northern lights, were visible as far south as Cuba, the Bahamas, Jamaica, El Salvador, and Hawaii. Another solar flare on March 13, 1989, caused geomagnetic storms that disrupted electric power transmission from the Hydro-Quebec Generation Station in Canada, plunging six million people into darkness for nine hours. The 1989 flare also caused power surges that melted power transformers in New Jersey. And in December 2005, x-rays from a solar storm disrupted satellites to ground communication and GPS signals for about 10 minutes. It sounds like a fascinating place and an object worth observing. However, if you would like to observe the sun, you must take extreme precautions. You cannot just use sunglasses and look at the sun or x-ray film or even neutral density filters because they may dim the sun's brightness, but they will still pass harmful infrared and ultraviolet light. And those wavelengths can damage your retina and in extreme cases cause blindness. If you'd like to study or observe the sun, you must use an eclipse glasses um, or number 14 welder's filter, not number 12, and place the glasses or the filter over your eyes before you look at the sun. You can also get solar uh, binoculars or filters that go over a pair of 50 millimeter binoculars. Orion sells uh, solar filters for binoculars. And with your unaided eye or with binoculars, you may be able to see sunspots on the sun as large as the earth or larger. If you want to observe the sun with a telescope, you must have a solar filter like this one that fits over the end of your optical tube and not over the eyepiece. That's very dangerous. Seymour Solar out of Utah makes premium solar filters for spotting scopes and telescopes. And they're rated in D5, so 99.9% .9 of the sunlight is blocked. And the aperture is made of a high quality reflective coated um, helio solar glass. And it's mounted into an aluminum outer cell like this one. And it slips over the end of your optical tube, just like this one. This is not a Seymour though and it's centered to the optical tube with thumb screws, just like this. Orion uh, Telescopes makes uh, solar filters for your telescope, and that's where I got this one, and Thousand Oaks Optical. They're both major suppliers of glass filters for any size telescope. A cheaper alternative to uh, a solar filter for your telescope is to get um, metal coated mylar film that you mount over the front of your telescope. Botter Planetarium makes this kind of solar filter. Mylar filters are the same quality as glass, but the mylar filter makes the sun look white or maybe even blue, while metal on glass or eclipse glasses make the sun appear yellow. Mylar made for car windows, birthday balloons, and space blankets cannot be used to view the sun. And watch out for eclipse sunglasses that are fake. Oh my God, it's raining. That do not, in fact, block the IR and ultraviolet rays. I gotta hurry and put my telescope away. I was gonna look at the sun. Once you have your solar filter on your telescope, it's very hard to find the sun. You cannot find it by looking through your uh, finder scope. And in fact, I took mine off. Uh, the way you find the uh, uh, sun uh, when you want to view it with your solar filter on is to point it and then look at the shadow cast and when the shadow is the form of a circle you're aimed at the sun and then you can look. Don't try to look at it through your finder scope. 
An alternative is to hold a white card a few inches away from the telescope eyepiece. Wow, this is terrible. I was going to look at the sun. I use astropheric for my weather forecast and it said zero cloud cover and it and my other app said no rain until 2 p.m., which is obviously incorrect. So I don't know if I'll be able to observe the sun or not, but let me try to finish this before it starts raining. I am a member of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. One of the perks of membership is that you get this magazine, Sky News. It's an excellent astronomy magazine with excellent articles that are well written. This one has one about capturing an image of a black hole in Sagittarius A. It has frequent contributions by Alan Dyer, noted amateur astronomer and astrophotographer. And in this month's issue, there just so happened to be this article called Capturing Sunspots by Lori and Kimberly Sibald. And they take pictures of the sun two ways, one way with just a DSLR and a 100 to 400 millimeter lens and a two times teleconverter. For that method, they had to wait for the sun to be low on the horizon with some thin cloud cover because as I mentioned, you cannot look directly at the sun, it's very dangerous. But using that method, they got these pictures of some sunspots. The second method, they used an Orion 80 millimeter apochromatic refractor with looks like several spacers and a dedicated astrophotography camera that's monochrome so their pictures are black and white but fabulous pictures of filaments on the sun i thought it was incredible and like planetary imaging you have to take video actually and then convert it to a photograph using some free online software registax and auto stacker to convert it to a photo. But the reason I thought this article was interesting was that they said that they've seen sunspots every day of 2022. I mentioned previously that the sun goes through cycles and in 2019 it was at a minimum and they predict that 2025 will be a maximum and so right now leading up to 2025 is an excellent time to see features on the sun including sunspots. I was able to see some and capture them with this telescope and a solar filter. A total solar eclipse passed right over my house when I was a child, uh, over our childhood home on March the 7th, 1970, and all I saw of it was a projection onto a piece of white paper. Not very satisfying. Do not use the projection method with a Maxitov Cassegrain, such as this telescope, or a Schmidt Cassegrain, as you could damage the telescope due to buildup of heat because they're closed systems. It's better to use a solar filter like this one. But with any of these methods, the main thing that you'll see are sunspots that are darker than the rest of the sun's surface. Small spots can last several days or they can uh, get into large groups for weeks. And there is uh, also a specialized filter that will block all of the light except for the wavelengths emitted by hydrogen atoms at 656 nanometers. And these use filters that will allow you to see the sun's chromosphere and see filaments and flares. And a telescope like that is very expensive. Orion makes the 40 millimeter Coronado refractor and it's about $700 and they can go all the way up to $8,000 for the Coronado 80 millimeter H alpha telescope. And with those telescopes, you can see granules, filaments and solar prominences. With his new 1.5 inch telescope, Galileo saw sunspots and he correctly identified them as blemishes on the sun. And he saw them just before a prolonged solar minimum when sunspots were rare. But the best thing to see when observing the sun is by far and away a total solar eclipse. There was one in 2017 across uh, parts of the United States, but I only saw the partial solar eclipse in California because I would have had to drive 
way far north towards Oregon, I think, to see the total solar eclipse, so I missed that one. But the next total solar eclipse visible from North America will be April the 8th, 2024, and it will pass over Mazatlan, Mexico, Austin and Dallas, Fort Worth, Texas, Little Rock, Arkansas, Indianapolis, Indiana, Cleveland, Ohio, Buffalo, New York, Montreal, and Fredericton, New Brunswick. And I plan on seeing that one and not some stupid projection on a piece of paper like March the 7th, 1970. For maps to find out where the 2024 eclipse will pass, or, or I think all eclipses, um, and the weather for that event, check greatamericaneclipse.com and eclipsophile.com. If you don't live in North America or you missed the one in 2024, you can go to Spain in 2026 or Luxor, Egypt in 2027. How cool would that be? Or Australia 2028 or Australia 2030. There will be an annular solar eclipse across the United States on October the 14th, 2023. An annular eclipse occurs when the moon is near apogee or the farthest point from the Earth so that the moon's disk is not quite large enough to cover the disk of the sun completely. And at mid eclipse, the sun turns into a ring of light or an annulus. So, that's worth checking out as a lead up to the total solar eclipse in 2024 and beyond. So that's it for chapter 14. Hope you enjoyed it and get out there and observe the sun. Now you have no excuses not to get out there because you can observe day or night. I'll see you in the next chapter. Until then, get out there and observe and enjoy our beautiful universe. Sula signing off. It's hard as hell to find the sun, except I've already got my solar glasses because I'm ready for 2024.